FBI Confidential, taking you inside the FBI with hosts Debbie Dujanovic, Cheryl Worsley, and Becky Bruce. Hello and welcome back to our podcast. I'm Becky Bruce and I am with Special Agent Elizabeth Green, who is here with me today. She is formerly from the FBI Salt Lake City Division, but has recently moved on to a different division. So thanks for coming back for us. Sure, no problem. That's kind of above and beyond the call of duty. Um, We are talking about sex trafficking, which I feel like most people have no idea just the scope of how big this problem is in the United States. That's correct, and I think that's why I'm so passionate about it and why I'm willing to come back and educate people in regards to it. Um, It's something that people are unaware that's going on, um, but people just need to be more educated to understand it. So how does this happen in the year 2018? It's actually modern day slavery, what we're seeing now. Um, So there's a whole aspect we can go to and how this is happening. I don't know if we want to take a little piece at a time or sure. jump right into it. Well, you've got some slides. So for those that are listening to us as opposed to watching, we'll kind of talk through sure. what we're looking at here. Tell me about some of these numbers. So these are nationwide stats that we're seeing. There's three and four um, adult prostitutes were introduced into the sex trade when they were juveniles. Um, when I was working this here in Salt Lake City, this is exactly the stat is what we saw. One in three minors living on the streets will be approached Um, to be lured into prostitution um, within 48 hours of them running away. The average age, and this is a nationwide stat, is 14 years old of a minor when she gets involved into the game. And when I'm saying the game, I'm referring to being trafficked or prostitution. Um, In Utah, when I was working this, what I saw, though, was the youngest 15 years old. Um, Unfortunately, pimps make a lot of money. I'm going to say pimps and I'm going to say traffickers in today's segments. Um, They're coincide, they're the same thing. I would say uh, uh, trafficker is a more politically correct term, Um, but the girls in the lingo that we use is referred to as a pimp. Um, They can make in excess of 100,000 a year um, with one girl, and most pimps have about one to three girls that they're trafficking. So it's a lucrative career for them. And I don't even want to say career because that's giving them more than what they should, but um, they know that there's so much money involved in this. But we also need to take a step back. And why are they making so much money is because there's a supply. We refer to them as the Johns. There's men who are wanting to exploit and have sex with these girls as well. So the more men that want younger girls, the more pimps are making money off that. And unfortunately in human trafficking, a pimp makes more money with a minor um, because most men want younger girls. Well, and to go back for just a second, um, when you said there were juveniles on the street that were approached and lured into prostitution, are we talking runaway kids? So we do see a lot of runaway children, unfortunately, in this. Um, There's venues for where this is occurring as well. In Utah, working my cases here, we all know Liberty Park right downtown. I had a case where a girl was just hanging out with her friends there and she got lured into trafficking by a record label company here in Utah. And they thought that she was pretty and they just said, do you wanna help promote the record label? Um, So she did and she just passed out flyers. Eventually they said she had a pretty voice. So then they brought her to the studio in Kearns and from there she got into trafficking. And that's just from a young girl, a juvenile, having having fun with her friends at Liberty Park, end up being trafficked and she was trafficked out of state for several years. And when you say a record label, I mean, that sounds like a legitimate business. So like it, it wasn't too many steps from, oh, well, sure, make a few extra bucks, pass out these flyers, help this company to you're a prostitute. Correct. And let's even as a young girl, when you have older men looking at you and telling you how sexy and how pretty and how much money you can make and just little things like that, sometimes they approach just as that. For her, it was these older men who were giving her attention to be part of this record label company that she knew about, and so to be popular and stuff like that. So yeah. there's many different avenues in how they can get these girls. This slide that we're looking at now, um, I just put up a few um, of the dreams that they offer these girls. Um, like I mentioned before, just attraction, telling them how, br- how pretty they are, how smart they are, how sexy. As a young girl, um, when you're getting attention, we've all been there. Uh, when you're getting attention from an older individual, that can be flattering. Um, Sometimes they provide understanding of what is your home life like? What are your parents, how strict are your parents? 
we see it a lot here in Utah, especially of, are you allowed to drink or can you smoke weed? Or if you come with me, I can provide that for you. Um, they also minimize what they're going to be getting involved with. Um, they glamorize it. It's going to, it's just a massage or it's just this or that. Um, so these girls a lot of times have no idea at all what they're getting themselves into. Um, and just promote it for more, you know, it, that's going to be some glamorous life and more than what it's going to be. Um, so these girls are naive um, into knowing um, what's going to be happening to them. You know, what you're saying does not sound all that different from the conversation I had with your agent here in Salt Lake on um, Internet crimes against children and the way that children are groomed online. Only it sounds like this happens more likely on the street. Is this grooming? It is, but we're not only seeing it on the street, we're seeing it um, also online, uh, a large majority as well online. So I don't have children, but if I did, I would be definitely checking their um, devices all the time. Um, numerous times, a lot of my cases just started with a pimp strolling through Facebook, and he's just looking through to see which girls he finds attractive, which girls he thinks look young, and then he just hits them up and sends them a message and a friend request and you look beautiful, you know, and getting to know them. And he slowly grooms them into leaving and meeting him. And then they go off and get involved in this. One thing that I was noticing was every time we have the Super Bowl, mm -hmm. it's, um, there's always a story about how tied to human trafficking those big events can be. If there weren't a demand Correct. from fellow human beings mm -hmm. for this type of service, and I'm using that word. I understand. Uh, um, is that how we stop it? If we, if we interrupt that supply and demand? Sure, but it's also finding the approach of how we do that. When you mentioned the Super Bowl, I've worked the Super Bowl um, for a week long and I've seen, um, I worked the one in Phoenix a couple years ago. And every girl I came in contact with was from out of state. Um, and the reason pimps do that is because they'll go to destination cities where there's going to be a large event, where mainly, largely men are going to be there. Why? Because exactly what you said, the supply and demand, because men want that, to have sex with these women and children, unfortunately. Um, so I think it would have to be probably at a local aspect with law enforcement in regards to punishments for the pimp. I'm sorry, for the John, um, because the John is the one who's having sex. So with these children, unfortunately, and these adults. So once we can put an end of harsher punishments on that, I think there'll be less of a <clears throat> demand for it. I feel like most Americans would have told you before hearing this conversation that they thought that most prostitutes in this country were there willingly. Yeah, so I think it's important that I distinguish the difference between prostitution and human trafficking. Unfortunately, those get combined together. They're both sad, heartbreaking incidents, um, but they're separate. Um, human trafficking is when there is force, fraud, or coercion involved. Um, and there's an individual who is collecting the proceeds from the sex act, human trafficking. So that's on one hand. Uh, prostitution is where we have a girl. Um, and I say, we, I think society, we say girls, women, females. There are also men involved in this as well. So I think we need to um, acknowledge that as well. While I work this in Utah, they were all females though. They're doing that on their own free will. Um, as female, as a female myself, do I want to help those girls get out of it? Definitely. I want to. I believe no girl wakes up one day and decides, I want to be a prostitute. There is something in their life that has happened um, that has made them cr go down that path and choose that decision, make that decision. Um, some is willingly and some is not. The unwilling is the human trafficking. The willingly is where they're trying to make some money to go to college or we have some girls on the street who are doing it for their next hit. Um, that's prostitution. They are collecting their own money or their own drugs that they're obtaining from that for their own will. Um, but like I said, myself, and I work most of my cases with Salt Lake Police Departments, um, when we do, whether they're doing it on their own free will or not, so we're trying to get them out of the game and help them um, succeed, get out and do something, um, have a income where they feel um, more proud of how they're making their money because no girl wants to sell their body for drugs or money. Is is um, pimping something that you get a high rate of reoffense with? With what I've seen, yes. The recidiv recidivism rate is quite high. And with the runaways, who are these kids? I mean, is it just, are they all walks of life, all financial backgrounds? And I'm glad you asked that question because unfortunately, um, 
people have this concept that it's just a certain type of individual that we're looking at. This can happen to your daughter, your niece, my cousin, my sister. This, um, these are all walks of life, um, both socioeconomic as well. Um, do we see a large percentage um, c do come from broken homes? Sure, but I've also seen quite a few in Utah that come from prominent families, that well-educated families who socioeconomic do quite well um, that are pulled into this as well. With events like the Super Bowl, but also just the term trafficking in general, there's an implied leaving where you came from and going somewhere else. Why is that? Um, I wish I had a clip to show you because there was an interview of a pimp in Phoenix that we were investigating. And we asked him about that. Why, does, why did he take his girls out of state? And we've asked numerous pimps that. And it's to get them out of their comfort zone. Hmm. Um, it's because if you take a girl and she's from here, she easily can run back, they think, to her friends or to her family or escape. It's out of her comfort zone, taking her on the other side of the country. Um, for Utah, um, what I saw here was a lot of girls coming from California, working here, then they'd go to Idaho, then they'd go to Montana as well, we'd see. We also, a case that I'm currently working on now, even though I've left, we're s it's still um, in the stages of being prosecuted, the girls came from the Midwest. Um, I've had a lot of victims come from Florida. When I interview these girls, I say, why, why Utah? What's the draw to Utah? On the map, you'll see the I-80 corridor. So that's a big thing, the freeways. Um, but also, they say the Johns are nicer here. They treat them better. They make more money here. Um, sometimes the competition isn't as high either, and they think it goes undetected in Utah. You know, we're showing a map right now, and I'll put this in the show notes later for those of you who are listening. Um, what really struck me when I saw this map was there, there are kind of red hot spots on the map showing you where human trafficking happens across the United States. And if you were to overlay that map with major population centers, it would pretty much correspond where there are people living, there are dots on the map. Where there are vast spaces of emptiness in the US, flyover country, there aren't as many dots, but they're still there where there are people. And I think that's because people are aware of that concept that, oh, people are ignorant to it here in Utah. People think it doesn't go on here. We're, we're going to set up shop here. Um, we have pimps come from all over the country that have set up shop here because they think it goes undetected. They think they're going to fly under the radar. They don't think law enforcement is looking into them. So they think this is a good spot for them to kind of hide out. Is it harder to find out that there's somebody who needs help who's been, you know, trapped in this lifestyle because they're away from those family and friends, and so they don't have somebody there locally advocating for them and saying, hey, I can't find my daughter, where is she? Correct, but we also work with the National Center for um, Missing and Exploited Children, NICMIC, that are housed in D.C. So when a child is, has gone missing or there is any um, cues maybe that they could be trafficked, um, they send that out to wherever they think the child may be or where the child came from. And so law enforcement from across the country will be notified of that, and then we'll start investigating that. You bring up another point though. Um, I will tell you, I've never had one girl raise her hand or walk into the FBI and say, I'm a victim of trafficking, help me. That's not how these cases work. So they're very difficult cases to work. Um, how do you find out about them? And I'll go into that. These girls are trained by their pimp to not say a word. If they do, they are threatened. Not only are they themselves threatened, but their family. A lot of these kids have kids of their own. And so they're threatened too that if you say anything, I'm gonna hurt your child. It's the Stockholm Syndrome. Um, so a lot of these girls, getting them to even, once we've identified them, we do a lot of sting operations with Salt Lake Police Departments. Um, we come into these hotel rooms and a lot of times they'll even lie that they're, they'll say they're of age. And it's not until we're able to I officially ID them that we know that they're minors. Um, but a lot of times they won't say a word about the pimp. They won't say that they've been beaten. They won't say that they've been trafficked out of state. They won't say anything until they feel comfortable and they trust you. So a lot of these cases are building rapport with these girls before they feel comfortable and that they're in a safe place, that they can divulge the information and that the individual that they're with is going to be incarcerated. Well, I imagine, I don't know, but I would imagine that some of them might feel like they're in trouble too. Initially they do, um, and so we do as best we can putting them at ease. I'll tell you, I've spent numerous hours in um, hotels, motels with cockroaches that are absolutely filthy and just not, let's say, for instance, we'll talk about a, a girl Kate. 
I won't talk about Kate and what she's involved with at the time. It's just getting to know Kate. Tell me where you came from. Tell me what your passions are. What do you like to do? Just you spend hours just getting to know them and providing them food, providing them shelter, um, letting them know that you'll be there for them and that they can trust you and looking at them as a victim and not a suspect in the case. So it sounds like building relationship is pretty important to what you do as a special agent. Huge. Um, you have to build relationships with these girls. And that's the beautiful part about this is I love the working this violation because when you do, you leave girls better than how you find them. Um, and almost all of my victims that I've come in contact with, I'm still in contact with. Actually driving here this morning, one of them just contacted me and she's doing well. She's with her boyfriend in Florida. She just got back from a cruise in the Bahamas. Um, they tell me when they graduate and get their GED. I've been to their graduations. They call me when they're pregnant. Um, in a good, healthy relationship, and I've been there and seen their babies. Um, we will be lifelong, um, have a relationship because of, I saw them at such a horrible spot in their life, but now to see them succeed and to um, succeed in um, society is an amazing part of this um, violation. Um, one of the other stats I saw was that in 2016, there were 82 juveniles recovered, um, with the youngest victim being 13. So I wanted to talk to you about if you have 2017 stats. I actually do. And just so everyone knows, what we're referring to are the stats are the Operation Cross Country. Operation Cross Country is a, a law enforcement um, operation that we do every year. It's led by the FBI. In doing so, we work with numerous local, state, and federal agencies. Um, I think 500 was the number this year of other agencies. We also had in Operation Cross Country um, different countries. We had Canada, United Kingdom, Cambodia, Thailand, and the Philippines that also participated. This year, um, it, as we're seeing on the board, it's 86 juveniles recovered. There were 166 pimps and others arrested, 103 Johns and rescued this year were 1,033 prostitutes, um, victims. Um, so it's a huge effort. It's a week-long initiative that we work on, and every year we kind of mix it up the time frame. Um, but our number one goal is to rescue juveniles and adults who are involved in sex trafficking. It sounds like a lot of people rescued, but I imagine we're scratching the surface. Unfortunately, yes. So I guess my question would be, do you have any success stories? I mean, obviously you've talked a little bit about how you stay in touch with people, but what's the takeaway for people who've listened to these massive numbers and are going, how do we even keep up? We keep up by educating the public of what's going on. We keep up by law enforcement being involved in this. Um, these are righteous cases. Like I said, this could be one of my sisters, your cousin, someone's daughter. Um, this could be anybody. Um, I think it's being aware too. Once you're educated, being aware. If you see something that doesn't look right, call law enforcement. Um, law enforcement can do welfare checks. These are um, not cases that are easily worked. Um, they're time consuming. They are, like I said, no girl walks in and says, I'm a victim. Um, they normally start just from something little that we, an inkling that doesn't seem right, or as proactive doing sting operations. Um, There's a video we're going to link to in our show notes that you sent to me ahead of time um, that shows um, it looks like a girl in a high school classroom and she's bright and she's engaged and she's doing everything. But then after school, um, her teacher looks across the parking lot and spots her getting in a car sort of maybe unwillingly. She can't quite tell and maybe being forced to take medication. And by the end of the, the video, you see the teacher deciding to say something. Is that what we need to be doing, looking out for this, that stuff that just doesn't quite seem right? Yes. Um, I also educate. I've done numerous every year here, Air, um, Salt Lake Airport Police, too. Girls travel on trains. They travel on buses. They travel, you know, all different um, modes of transportation. Um, making people aware when you go into a gas station, maybe something doesn't seem right. Um, numerous of my girls couldn't look up, couldn't talk to another individual there's bruising if you know um, he's controlling the whole situation sometimes these girls have been beaten bad enough or they've been kidnapped from their family you know taken away that they'll finally want help and they'll do extreme measures or um, we had a case here in Salt Lake where the girl texted her sister she was able to finally grab a phone and she texted and said that I'm at this hotel call the police tell them I can't get out and so I went with Salt Lake PD, and that's how we were able to rescue one of the girls. Thank goodness for that girl's sister. Yeah, exactly. 
Well, I thank you so much for taking the time to talk a little bit about um, human sex trafficking and opening our eyes, hopefully somewhat, to just how big the magnitude of the problem is here in Salt Lake City and across the country. This is Special Agent Elizabeth Green with us here on the podcast. Thank you very much.